Hi everybody, I'm Tim Durling and it's time for another edition of Tim's Vinyl Confessions. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is an episode that I've been wanting to do for quite some time. I've been uh, have this concept to do this particular episode, but it's um, it's not going to be as straightforward as most of the episodes I do. First of all, it's a CD episode, so I'm going through an artist's CD catalog, but it's uh, a band that I've been a fan of since 1986. And I'll always refer to myself as a fan. It's just that I haven't been a fan of much of the music that this band has put out, well, for quite a long time now. And that band is Bon Jovi. So it's sort of a, uh, I guess you could describe it as a complicated relationship. Because they got me into music in a serious way. Uh, I mean, I've loved music since I, as far back as I can remember. But they got me into wanting to actually invest in buying albums by artists, not just recording songs off the radio. When Slippery When Wet made it big in 1986, game changer for me. Changed the whole musical path that uh, I'm kind of still on. So, subsequently, the first few things I'm going to talk about in this episode, it's going to be cinch for me to do. So some of my favorite albums of all time. After that, first of all, I'm missing a bunch of the catalog. And a lot of the ones that I'll be talking about, I'm really just not a fan of. But I'm going to go over what I've got. I'd love to get some differing opinions on here. I mean, a lot of people just dismiss them outright and say, well, yeah, they always did suck. But this isn't for that. This is for people that grew up like I did, got into the band, and uh, tried valiantly to hang on. Most bands I can hang with, with changes. I mean, Def Leppard did Slang. I wasn't a fan of that album, but I was still a fan of the band. Um, and the thing is, Bon Jovi have never... Two things. Um... Number one, they've never had a back-to-basics album. They've never had an album that sounded anything like the first four since the first four. And in some ways that's admirable, but uh, they've just gone in different directions. And second, I guess the reason they've never had a bad back-to-basics album is because they've never had a lack of success. They continue to be one of the most successful rock bands from that era. And the only band that was ever considered at any one time hair metal, even though they never really were, that can still sell out big places and still sell, you know, copies of their new music. So why would they change? So this is just all my opinion. And, uh, but for the most part, it's going to be fun going over this stuff. Because like I said, some of my favorite albums of all time. So I'll start with the first Bon Jovi album, an overlooked album, I, I think, from 1984. This is a Canadian version on Mercury. And like... All, you know, Mercury CDs at the time have this Atomic logo on it. At the time that I bought this, I wasn't into vinyl at this point. It was just merely cassettes. And then when we first got a CD player in the house, it was buy a few CDs here and there. This was the first time I had copies of uh, the lyrics to the songs. Not that, not that the lyrics were particularly hard to understand. Uh, the second one, 1985, 700 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a U.S. edition on Mercury. These aren't originals. They're probably just reprints that are exactly like the originals. Same, uh, same design as the first album. It was pretty standard for Mercury at the time. Now this has all the lyrics and credits. What it doesn't have, and what I'm sure like subsequent remasters have, is all the pictures that are inside the record, which is them and a lot of other bands, which is a pretty cool collage of pictures. Okay, so now this is the big one. This was the game changer for me, of course. It needs no introduction. Slippery when wet. I don't have any variations of the uh, the Japanese the band cover. This is just this is the one right here. Simple concept, that logo. This is a very very important album for me. This is a U.S. edition. I didn't actually have this on CD till probably I want to say '92. So. The cassette I had was well used, well worn. There's a little bit more in this. It's got the lyrics, which the Canadian cassette did not have. The U.S. cassette did. That's just the inside of it. Of course, these have all been reissued several times. I don't have any of the newer versions of the first three albums. Summer of 1987 on cassette. That's all I listened to pretty much with those three albums. And uh, the album that I was the most excited most looking forward to getting out 
was this one, New Jersey. Of course, I bought it on cassette. Uh, but this is a Canadian Columbia House version of New Jersey, Mercury Records. This is my favorite Bon Jovi album. Customize, customization on the CD when you sell that many albums. Next time around, you get a little customization. At the time, this picture was significant because it's the first time that like, John had his back turned and the rest of the band were vocal. He really wanted them to be perceived as a band, which is interesting when you consider the band's history. Uh, all the thank yous, all of the, um, the lyrics, just like was inside the cassette. And uh, earlier, I did an episode where I went through deluxe editions of albums. This is the deluxe edition of New Jersey. It's a really well put together package. But uh, I won't go into much detail here with this. If you want to just type in Tim's Vinyl Confessions Deluxe Editions, you'll find the episode where I talk about this and a lot of other reissues of classic albums. This is well worth getting. If you like the album, you don't have this, it's worth shelling out for. So after that was a lengthy hiatus for the band. Uh, John and Richie both did solo albums. Honestly, wondered if there was going to ever be another Bon Jovi album, but there was uh, towards the end of 1992. This came out, Keep the Faith. And to, for me, this is the last, I'll choose my words carefully here, for me, this is the last good Bon Jovi album. Just my opinion. There's probably other people that said, you never had a good album. And there's probably other people saying, oh, no, no, this one's good, that one's good. For me, this is it. This was, and, and even a lot of people my age couldn't hang with this album because it was a little different. Now, I did. I liked this album a lot. This is a U.S. edition on Mercury, and uh, this is what the, the CD itself looked like. This was a, you know, particularly, I, I have an affection for this album beyond the music on it. This is actually when I first saw them in concert. I saw them twice on this tour, my first two concerts ever, and in the first concert in Portland, Maine, I actually met John very, very briefly and got his autograph. I think I go over that uh, tour books episode that I did long, long time ago. Anyway, this was a good album. Uh, it actually was the perfect album for them for the 90s, and they were able to ride out the, the grunge era and still sell millions of albums. So, um, And there's still some songs on here that I would consider... Well, there's actually some pretty heavy stuff on here. If I Was Your Mother was a heavy song. Dry County has some heavy parts, um, I believe. There's just there's good stuff on this. I thought this was a well-put-together, well-paced album. I actually have a, a secondary edition of this one, too. Uh, in uh, 1993, and this is actually one that I still haven't opened. And if I haven't opened it now, I probably won't. This is a special edition of Keep the Faith. One of the last things I bought at Sam the Record Man in Woodstock when it was closing up, which is was sad because I bought a lot of music there. It's a two CD set. It uh, has an, a second disc, a live, some live songs, and uh, also there is... At the end of disc one, this is a song called Save a Prayer. It's not the Duran Duran song, but it was a bonus track that um, came out on this, this reissue. And I think it was a B-side on some of the singles. So then in 94, after 10 years and a lot of success, this album I, you could still find at any given Walmart, I'm sure, in their $5 bin. And if you don't have any Bon Jovi, it's a great place to start. It's called Crossroad, the best of Bon Jovi. This did well for the band. This is what uh, Mercury Polygram CDs looked like in the mid-90s that were customized. Pretty good song listing. You know, they eventually put out a two-disc Greatest Hitch, which I don't have, but uh, this, was, this was good. This came with it, and I thought this was good. This had all their albums and all their VHS tapes that were out at the time, but also, I actually didn't have all of them, but uh, I also like the fact that they included um, John Bon Jovi's Blaze of Glory solo album, and also Richie Sambora's Stranger in This Town. A very, very underrated, overlooked album. So, the this folds out. So the whole side of this is just a... This probably was an inner sleeve on the vinyl, which only would have come out overseas. Just a little bit of credits there. So, all right, now we've reached the mid-90s. Now, for me, here's where things start to go a little bit. Uh, 
let's say off. So the next thing to come up by Bon Jovi came out in 1995. These days, now by now, Alex John Such had left the group or quit or wherever it went, and there's a whole sag of, you know, did he actually play? Is he actually playing the albums? Some say Hugh McDonald played all the bass. You know, was he actually playing live? I'd like to think so. Somebody must have been. Anyway, so from here on, and for a very, very long time after, they were only pictured as a four-piece, even though Huey McDonald was on bass throughout, starting out as a session guy, and eventually would get signed in as a full-fledged member. This looks just like a crossroad disc. This is a Canadian Columbia House version. This is the first time that I didn't rush right out and buy a Bon Jovi album when it first came out. Uh, first single, This Ain't a Love Song, was another ballad. I mean, they'd already, you know, I gave them a pass with Always uh, from Crossroad because it made sense to me that they put out a Greatest Hits album and that the single would be a ballad. So that was okay. And the other new song that was on Crossroad, Someday I'll Be, Someday I'll be Saturday Night, I really liked that one too. That was sort of more of an acoustic rock thing. Um, little did I know that those two songs were going to kind of shape a lot of the direction that they would go in. Now, there are, are a few decent tunes on here, but for the most part, I find this album slow and draggy. So I only bought it when it became available in Columbia House, because I am a completist at this point. It was still important to me to have all of them. Besides, I thought, well, maybe next time. Maybe next time will be better. Pretty extensive... Um, credits, I mean the lyrics are in here obviously, but uh, there's a lot going on here, and you know, I guess you could say their lyrics were getting better, but the music wasn't, uh, that's, again, this is all just my opinion, but it is kind of my channel, so, um, and again, I'll defend Bon Jovi, you know, to anybody who would, who would uh, you know, criticize their music, but I just can't hang with most of this, this stuff from here on in. So it was a long hiatus, uh, so between 95 and 2000 there was no new Bon Jovi music. John released another solo album in 97 called Destination Anywhere, which I heard two songs off if that was enough to say that this is not for me. Didn't feel any pull to buy it because it was a solo album. Uh, Richie put out another solo album in 98 called Undiscovered Soul, which I didn't like nearly as much as Stranger in This Town. So it's just a little bit too mellow, and that just that kind of speaks to where they were heading. Then, in 2000, out of nowhere, I was listening to the radio, and I heard this song called It's My Life. Now, instantly, I knew it was Bon Jovi. Not only that, but it was classic-sounding Bon Jovi. It was kind of a sequel to Live Not a Prayer, lyrically. It was an anthem, which the best of their songs were. And I got really, really excited. I'm like, they're back. They, 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 had, they were out of the scene for a while, and now they're back. Well, yes and no. Uh, this is Crush. This is their 2000 album first new album in uh, five years, and in this time they kind of morphed into Island Records, which was still distributed by Universal, so it was still like their original contract. Kind of interesting graphics here. And uh, so It's My Life was the first song, first single off this, and was a, a pretty su substantial comeback song for them, and kind of introduced them to a new generation. Now I wish I could say that I enjoyed this entire album as much as that one song. But sadly, that's not the case. Um, I do really like the last song in this album, a song called One Wild Night, which, now that I think about it, kind of has similar pacing, similar phrasing to It's My Life. Maybe that's why I like it. So this album is bookended by two good tr songs, and the rest of it just, I don't know, there's just nothing that, um, to me, there's, there's not a lot that breaks a sweat. And even the ballads aren't always convincing. They used to be counted for great ballads, and it seems to me that was kind of, well, okay. So, but they were back, they were making music, and there was a few good songs. So I'm hanging in there, I'm hanging in there. Uh, 2001, the first ever live album from Bon Jovi came out. It's called uh, One Wild Night Live, 1985 to 2001. This is a really entertaining collection. This is a Canadian version I have here. This spans all the way from, like they said, 1985, like there's versions of In and Out of Love. I think uh, Runaway's on here. It's got a couple of curiosities. They've got uh, a version of um, I Don't Like Mondays by the Boomtown Rats featuring Bob Geldof. They do that in London. Uh, and John mentioned something about being the 10th anniversary of Live Aid. They do all, there's a live version on here uh, of Neil Young's Rockin' in the Free World, which they did in Johannesburg, South Africa. So, 
radio programmers, I'm sure, if they were diehard Bon Jovi fans, you could play a Bon Jovi fan and it would count as CanCon because it was a Neil Young song. So this was a good collection. Um, this had another, like Crossroad did, some uh, also available. And again, grateful that they were including Richie's solo stuff. Full packaging in here, like any live album would have. It's a live compilation, like it's it's not uh, you know not one particular concert. This just highlights. It's a cool write up in here um, by Lon Friend, who used to do uh, pirate radio on Saturday nights. Not not actual pirate radio. That was just the name of it. But uh, you've probably seen him in a lot of rock documentaries. Metallica, Motley Crue come to mind. He does a pretty cool write up about the band. So, continuing, uh, 2002, a new Bon Jovi album came out called Bounce. Uh, this album, to me, isn't bad. Um, there were no big singles off of this one. The, the, uh, Every Day was probably the biggest thing on here. There was another song called Misunderstood that was that got a little bit of radio play. Uh, lyrically, a lot of this album was influenced by 9-11, because it's the first thing that came out after. This is a Canadian edition. And again, I don't listen to this album much, but uh, I don't remember thinking that there wasn't anything. There's some, there was some decent stuff on here. Uh, you know, usual credits and lyrics inside of here. So Bounce is an album that kind of probably I, I give more of a pass to because it didn't contain any hit singles that I didn't like that, that radio just would not leave alone. Uh, kind of the same as Aerosmith's Nine Lives. This is sort of a dark horse of these later years Bon Jovi albums. Now the first thing that came out from Bon Jovi, the band that I didn't buy, had no intention of buying and will probably never own, is an album they put out in 2003 called This Left Feels Right. I don't know if you could call it a straight ahead acoustic album, because an acoustic album from them back in the day would have been awesome because they were really good at stripping the songs down and just, you know, uh, getting to the core of them. I heard uh, rework, so I think there were some new songs, two or three new songs on this thing. The rest of it was reinterpretations of older songs. And when I heard the version of Wanted Dead or Alive, in my opinion, they took a classic song and destroyed it. I just, that was it. I said, I'm not buying it. Which is, for me, and my wife makes fun of me all the time for this, it was hard because I'm a fan and I just feel like I have to support the band, but I, I couldn't go with them there. So moving on, uh, 2004. 100 million Bon Jovi fans can't be wrong. Um, Year-end episode Matt and I did last year where we go through our favorite box sets. I discussed this in depth, so I won't uh, spend any time on it here. I just want to show it off because that's the next thing that came out. Uh, 2005. 2005, next album to come out was this one, Have a Nice Day. Uh, of course, the you know the title song became got a little bit of radio play. It was sort of like It's My Life Part 2. It was all right. Yeah, I didn't mind it, and, you know, some of the stuff on here, it's a listenable enough album, but a Bon Jovi album to me should be more than listenable, it should be really enjoyable. Uh, the biggest song on here, and a harbinger to where they would go in the future, is Who Says You Can't Go Home, which is a duet from Jennifer Nettles of Sugarland. I'm not a country music fan. Never was, never will be. And that's the direction that they would find themselves going in. Let's talk. Let's talk about this one in the meantime. Well, this is a Canadian Columbia House version. Again, waited to. It's one of the last new ones I bought from Columbia House because it wasn't a member long after that. Um, waited until it came out. So you know the lyrics, packaging. Still is you know pictures as a four-piece band. Uh, the next thing to come out from Bon Jovi came out in 2007 it was an album called Lost Highway, which was their Nashville album, their country album. I don't own it. 2009, um, The Circle came out. Some signs of life with this one. Um, I, I still like the single off of this, um, We Weren't Born to Follow. To me, that's a Bon Jovi anthem. It's what they did best. I really wish there was a little bit more crunch in the guitars. You know, they were never heavy. They were barely hard rock, but Sam Moore always had a little bit more crunch in his guitar in the early days. And I think a lot of these songs would be improved and sound like they have a little bit more life to them if that was the case. I'd say there's about 
three or four songs on this that, that I liked, um, which is not a great percentage, but I guess it's better than nothing. It's not enough to make me reach for it, though. And it's still a four-piece, even though Hugh McDonald's, you know, playing the bass. Uh, so, okay, here's where we're missing some. Missing a lot, actually. So 2010, they put out a Greatest Hits, two discs, with uh, a couple of new songs, that neither of which I liked. Uh, 2013, they put out an album called Because We Can. Don't have that one. And then Richie Sambora left. And Phil X is a great guitar player, but he's, his, his talents are kind of going, you're not really hearing what he can do in this band. And Richie just, I mean, he's such a part of Bon Jovi. That, uh, that was a, that was unfortunate. I understand why it happened, but it's unfortunate. Now, in 2015, um, the band, I guess, owed their previous record company, a record contract, one more album. And so they kind of released this as a very no-frills album, uh, there was no tour, and it was all about getting ready for the, the album that would follow. Now, way, way back, Matt and I did an episode, the Rolling Stone Top 50 Hair Metal Albums, which is an expression I hate, but of course Slippery and Wet was on that list. So as we did that, when we were, um, we'd gone to, uh, you know, look for some music before that, I saw this at the front counter, and um, it was only seven ninety nine. So Matt's like, you might as well get that, it's only seven ninety nine, and I kind of wish I'd left it there. It's Burning Bridges. Just a little thin little thing here. I did a review episode that on this a while ago. This is... To me, this is not Bon Jovi. And in 2016, they put out This House Is Not For Sale, which I, I wish I could say I could get into some of the stuff I heard off it, but I just can't. But again, you go back to what I talk about these early albums. They're so important to me. They're some of my all-time favorite albums, favorite songs. And they forever formed the way that, in my mind, rock music should sound. The big... Uh, Bruce Fairburn, Bob Rock, production, uh, catchy choruses, melody, but with, with lots of electric guitars, and, uh, you know, love always have that importance. So, that's it for the Bon Jovi CDs. I do want to talk about a couple other things. Um, this CD right here has been reissued in several configurations. It's John Bon Jovi, that's the actual spelling of his name. This is called the Power Station Sessions, 1980 to 1983. If you know the history of Bon Jovi, John started out working at the Power Station Studios in New York. Uh, his uncle, Tony Bon Jovi, owned the place. So when he said he working there, he was sweeping the floors. He was doing just odd things around there, basically, for his uncle. But through that, he kind of got to know the trade of making music, started to write his own songs and record his own songs. And uh, so there's a list of songs on here. These are demo-quality songs. Some of them sound like they could have conceivably ended up on the first Bon Jovi album. This is not an official release. This one I've got here is Masquerade Music. So it's, it's you know, a bootleg at best. But I kind of get a kick out of some of these songs. You can really tell some of them are very derivative of other songs. So it's uh, something interesting if you're really, really a fan of the early Bon Jovi stuff. It's worth checking out. Malcolm Dome, well-known UK rock journalist, writes liner notes inside of this. And I've seen it quite cheap, and with different covers on it. It's worth picking up. And of course, as a solo artist, the, the biggest success he had was the first solo work he did was the Young Guns 2 soundtrack, Blaze of Glory, which came out in 1990. Uh, title song was a number one song, and All Miracle was another uh, top 20 single. Again, I thought they might have been breaking up at this point, but... This is actually a really good album from start to finish. It's, uh, you know, most of the songs could have been Bon Jovi songs. Uh, poster on one side, and on the other, lyrics. Now, he's got a lot of guest stars in this album. Uh, Jeff Beck, uh, Kenny Aronoff plays the drums in this album. Randy Jackson plays bass. Uh, collaborated with Aldo Nova in this album, which led to Aldo's Blood in the Bricks album, which I want to do an episode on Aldo Nova. I'm a big fan of his, too. Um, Robin Crosby from Rat is on here. Elton John's on here. It's a good album. It's uh, it's not one I, I would say if you're a Bon Jovi fan, you never got around to getting this actual album. Pick it up. You might you find that you like it quite a bit. So that's a look at my CD collection of Bon Jovi. What do you think? Am I missing something? Should I should I give some of those later albums a chance, or 
Just leave it as it is. What do you think? Comment below. And thank you for watching Tim's Final Confessions.